Uh, welcome to this week's Club Zone video in which we're going to be exploring how your club can plan to safely restart training activity. This week you've got two of us presenting. Uh, I'm Gareth and um, my partner in crime is Robbie Bell, who's the RDO for the Eastern Region. So it's worth noting that while we've got these restrictions in place, they are easing a little and some training may be possible but we still need to be um, cautious. We still need to adopt that considerate and conservative approach to, to all of our activities as we start to get back afloat. So to help us better understand what's possible um, with restarting training activity, we're gonna be first of all interviewing Craig Burton, who works in the RWA training department and has coordinated and written much of their restarting training activity guidance. And then a little bit later on, we're gonna be speaking to Tris Best, He's the uh, owner and manager of the OTC, uh, a Windsor centre down in Weymouth, that's already successfully restarted training activity to see what we can learn from him. But let's, um, let's start with Craig. Um, so Craig, um, what's your role within the organisation? Hi Gareth, uh, so I'm the training resource manager, which means I directly manage the e-learning publication team, uh, but I also deputise for the director of training uh, on all manner of other matters. And I suppose the, the key part of my role is ensuring that the various disciplines in the schemes and the support material don't go off on their own separate directions. We're, we're both instructors, lots of other people are too, and, and we know that instructors have been concerned about uh, validity of their qualifications, especially the first aid tickets. So what changes have you made in that area to be more flexible? Uh, so there's a variety of changes that, that we put in place with regards to first aid certificates, and primarily to enable instructor certificates to remain valid. So I suppose the, the, the starting point is any certificate that expires after the 1st of March, we will see as valid without any action up to the 30th of September. So we'll, we'll see that as an extended validity for any first aid certificate. Additionally, in our way, first aid certificate can be extended by one year from its expiry date, whenever that is, by completing a short update with an our recognised uh, first aid centre, uh, which could be done as online, so no need to go into a classroom. Uh, and that extended certificate would be actually valid for those on commercial vessels, um, such as the Yachtmaster instructors, cruising instructors and advanced powerboat instructors. We'll also accept any other extended first aid certificate, provided it's been extended due to an update from either the original issuing body or an hourly recognised training centre. And due to the health and safety requirements on non-cruising centres, uh, they need to ensure they have at least one qualified first aider on site when training is taking place, and that first aider shouldn't be relying on an extended certificate. Hmm. That's going to be key for the clubs that, that you know most of whom are going to be listening to this. So still need a qualified first aider on site, so we can pick up on that first key point. Um, and is that the same for instructor qualifications? How does that work? Uh, it's similar. Uh, it's a little bit different. Um, for the dinghy, windsurfing, keelboat, in the waterways, personal watercraft, and powerboat instructor qualifications. If they expire after the 20th of March, we'll automatically deem them as valid up to and including the 30th of June. So there's no action needed to be taken there. Uh, but the revalidating of these qualifications is primarily an administrative task uh, and can be done online. So actually they can revalidate you know, at any time before it expires if, if they wish. The Cruising Yacht Master Instructor qualifications require a practical update. Uh, and with those, if they've expired after the 1st of January, uh, we'll accept them as valid up to and including the 30th of September 2020. And we're hoping after that we should be able to be providing some sort of updates after that. Um, the other element, of course, to this is, is RA training centre inspections as well. Have training centres got to be inspected before they can restart RA training activity? Or? No, um, assuming the centre was current and able to operate prior to the lockdown, then once they're able to start training, uh, then they can carry on training. Uh, if we can't inspect them due to the lockdown, we'll, no centre is going to be disadvantaged or penalised for that due to, due to the impact of the pandemic. No, brilliant. OK, that sounds great. So I've already mentioned um, the OTC down in Weymouth and, and the, the, there may be one or two others that have started to offer one-to-one um, -one training or, or training for very small groups. Um, but we've got these new changes or relatively new changes that came in recently to government guidance that means it might now be possible to run training for slightly larger groups. Um, what, do you, what do you think about this? What do you think is possible? Yeah, so certainly in England, the ability to meet in groups of up to six 
outside of sport or recreation means it may well be possible to do some practical training for up to five students with one instructor. And the key thing is that the two metre social distancing will still be in place. So the most likely activity would be windsurfing or single-handed sailing, although members of the same household could share a double-hander um, because they don't have to require the two metre distance in that instance. Yeah, great stuff. OK, so there are some options there, but, you know, as I said right at the beginning, we need everyone to be super, super cautious and considerate, don't we? But um, if a, if a club was looking to restart training activity, what, what advice would you give them, Craig? Because I know people are thinking about it now. So, uh, I mean, the best thing really is to make sure you check the latest guidance from the training department on the website. And then you have to force yourself to carry out a very objective assessment of your ability to meet the government advice. And we're all exceptionally keen to get back to training, but we need to make sure that we can comply with the social distancing and not put anybody under any unnecessary risk. And as you mentioned in your intro, the guiding principles uh, of only following government advice and taking a considered and conservative approach. And that, that, that is absolutely key in, in doing this safely and, and responsibly. Yeah, good, absolutely. So um, it, it, it's a million dollar question. It is the million dollar question, but when do you think we'll be able to, to resume normal training activity? Well, if I was able to give a definitive answer, I would. But if I was able to give a definitive answer to that, then I probably wouldn't be working at the RWA because I'd have picked the winning lottery numbers every week for the last 20 years. So I'd have been on a beach somewhere. Um, so we are seeing some activity returning overseas, but it's very small numbers. Uh, Australia, for example, are beginning to, 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 to open up. Um, and even within the UK, the home countries each have got a slightly different approach to easing the lockdown. Um, but the over, overarching common theme is the two metres social distance, distancing requirement, uh, which must be adhered to. And there are some mitigating circumstances for those that are um, at work not being able to fully achieve social distancing. And we've seen this in some of the key industries in the UK, like the fish farm industry. Uh, but in those instances, they, these are employees being trained at the workplace and, an, and it's been approved by government and there's an extremely rigorous PPE and cleaning regime for, for that to take place. So I think to get anywhere near normal, that two metres two metre distancing will need to be modified somehow for the majority of our training to really genuinely be able to go back to something like normal. And also, clearly, the ability to meet inside will become important, particularly as we move into colder weather in the autumn. So I think those are the two key milestones for us. We're keeping an eye on the 15th of June for the announcements to see whether there's anything that may open up some form of training there, particularly as that's where some non-essential retail may open and then the 1st of July will be the, the second one where we're hoping that that will give us something a little bit more concrete but it is really wait for the announcements and then usually takes a few days to get clarity from government um, and then we can we can push out the information as soon as we have it. Yeah brilliant so we're getting there but um, it's an ever-changing situation isn't it so keep 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 looking at the ROA training website pages and and um, and looking out for that guidance as it evolves and and uh, we'll, we'll keep keep helping the clubs and the training centers so um if anyone out there has got questions about restarting training activity what's the best way to get in touch with you and the team so while we're all working at home we are still able to take calls from our, from our normal work emails and that's uh, our phone numbers and we're uh, also answering emails so all our contact details are on the training support site so uh, you can contact us as you would normally and um, either the relevant chief instructor or straight to the training at our.org.uk email. Brilliant. Thanks, Craig. That's been really useful. Hopefully that will help the clubs that are thinking about restarting training activity or, or just considering it for, for weeks or months down the line. Just um, it's been, been really useful. And so next we're going to have a look at, at uh, what they're doing at the OTC down in Weymouth and, and see if we can we can learn from Tris and, and the team down there. At the time of filming this, we're not aware of any clubs that are offering RYA training yet. So we've decided we're going to talk to Tris Best, who runs a commercial training centre down in Weymouth. So although there are some differences between how clubs and centres operate, essentially we're all operating under the same RYA training centre standards. So I think this is going to be really useful for RYA affiliated clubs that are also RYA training centres. So Tris, um, looks like you're down at the OTC down in Weymouth and it looks like a good day to get on the water. 
how did you decide to restart training? What process did you go through? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, just to, to give you a little bit of background, the OTC is based at the National Sailing Academy down um, down in Portland. Um, and obviously, being based here, we have um, sort of we come under the umbrella of the National Sailing Academy. Um, and obviously, we operate on Portland Harbour. So we have a few people to obviously kind of um, address and, and discuss our operations with on a fairly regular basis. Obviously, the National Sailing Academy being one. And then secondly, the Portland Harbour Authority. So before even addressing and actually discussing reopening, um, we had to sort of, um, you know, obviously listen to the guidelines from government um, and the ROA, but also um, discuss it with the National Sailing Academy and the Portland Harbour Authorities. It's, it's great that we're able to get back on the water. It's so good for our physical and sort of mental well-being, isn't it? It just uh, feels feels so good. But, um, yeah. you know, you, you've mentioned the restrictions that, that are in place, social distancing and so on. How has that affected how you're promoting training and actually what you can offer? Is it business as usual or, or have you had to adapt what you're, um, uh, you're offering? Very different. So um, so the first and foremost thing is that we, we normally have quite a lot of passing trade um, that people come down in a normal summer. You know, you have a lot of people that walk in. They want to hire things and the first thing we had to cut out was was no passing trade whatsoever so the the people that do come to the center um have already pre-booked um we know the numbers that are going to come each day and we have um a definite amount that we can handle um in in every hour of the day if you see what i mean so so it's already pre-booked it's 24 hours ahead if people kind of turn up on our door and go, oh, can we hire? It's a straightforward no. It's a, it's as simple as that. It's black and white. Um, so that was the first thing. Obviously, then you're looking at um, sort of what we can actually provide. So um, first and foremost, obviously, we are um, we do various different water sports, but we are a rental center. Um, and then we also obviously are a recognized training center. So we provide tuition as well. Um, and we've massively had to reduce the numbers that we do. Um, so we're talking at four at any one time. So four people down here. Um, and, you know, that m number might increase, but I just wanted to start with a number that everybody was comfortable with and happy with, that we could easily maintain that social distancing. So, um, and that that's relevant for staff and for, for um, the number of clients coming through as well. Is, is there a particular type of customer that you've been trying to attract? And... And you've already mentioned that you've been turning away um, higher customers. Are there any other customers that actually you think I just can't accommodate your needs right now? With regards to windsurfing, it's um, it's really a case of uh, just limiting numbers. There's not a, a group as such that we can't do. It's just making sure that we're doing it in a manner that is is achievable. So, um, you know, we, we are teaching beginners right through to say wind foiling and we're teaching people how to wind foil. Um, and that, that seems quite a popular one. Um, but I would say that, uh, the, the actual, um, what we can provide, um, hasn't as such, um, come down. It's really just a case of the numbers have come down. I suppose, um, it'd be good to rewind a little bit and think about the actual process of somebody booking into a um, onto a course or onto a session with you. How are you managing to protect you and the team? And uh, have you managed to go paperless, for instance? How, how's that part working? Yeah. So, so that that in itself. I mean, luckily we we sort of had um, a sort of system in place whereby it was fairly easy just to kind of revert from, say, for example, accepting cash to to straightforward people can can. Um, can book in beforehand. So uh, we have an online booking system anyway, so people can book through our website. Um, when it comes down to people booking ahead, they need to phone up, they can pay over the phone by card, um, or they can do a bank transfer, we can send them an invoice and do that. When it comes to our risk statement, we use a, a, a thing called Waiver Forever, so that again, they can, they can fill it in online before they actually come to them to, down to the center so we can we can have a view of that we can look at that well in advance before they actually approach us approach the yeah. center yeah good that makes sense and have, have you had to tweak your joining information then have there been any changes to that or has that remained consistent uh little little things for example um 
the National Sailing Academy have uh, closed their um, changing rooms so that they're, they're, those facilities are not available. They have a very strict one-way system when it comes to using the toilets. Um, and, you know, you can effectively go and use the toilet um, without touching anything, um, particularly as a bloke. But um, but you you effectively, you know, the, the, the system there, you, um, you know, the sanitizers, uh, sanitizers very, very visibly at, at every point. Um, and uh, and the one-way system means there's no crossing in the in the corridor at all between between people. Um, so yeah, so that that's changed. So we recommend people if they have their own wetsuit, they bring their own wetsuit. Um, if they um, if they don't, then obviously we'd like to know in advance so we can provide provide the wetsuit. Um, and uh, and then obviously it's it's uh, sanitized at the end. So we've got a big dunking bucket with um, with the right disinfectant in there. Um, and uh, they ask they're asked to change by their um, vehicle, leave their valuables in the vehicle, um, and when they come to the centre, um, like I said, they've already filled in their their risk statement. Um, but in in that respect, we will we will ask them to remain in a specific area. Um, so that, that's how we've kind of changed it. Normally it was much more sort of hands-on and welcoming and showing them the facilities and all the rest of it. Now it's very much sort of, this is our little bubble uh, on the corner of the slipway of the National Science Academy, and this is where we're going to operate. And there's no necessity to go anywhere else really, um, unless they specifically need to go to the toilet. It feels like, I feel, that feels great. And it feels like people want to know what the ground rules are now. People. Are, are kind of been affected by this clearly and it really helps them to understand what, what what's possible now. I mean, you know, we, we've kind of agreed amongst the team that if we try to uh, sort of instigate these these changes at the beginning of lockdown, a lot of people would be up in arms and kind of scratching their heads and, and unfamiliar with it. And having had lockdown and now actually implementing the, these changes, there is a real appetite to Number one, get on the water, obviously, but also just be respectful for one another. Well, you know, so everybody's, you know, trying to maintain that distancing, um, and you know, just the atmosphere is is very patient. You know, they, there's no rushing whatsoever, um, and you know, people are sort of more hesitant in in rather than just sort of coming in and and you know grabbing kit and going on the water and being enthusiastic. There's there's much more patience, you know, which is which is good yeah. to see. And you mentioned the team there. Um, thinking about your instructors, I know I know you've got some of them back from from furlough. But um, when you were getting ready to reopen, what training or CPD did you did you carry out with them to to help them prepare for this? So um, even before lockdown, um, and obviously the the with the sort of the changing environment as it sort of changed literally by the hour, um, we'd already sort of um written some revisions to our operating procedures anyway um so once we we had full lockdown on the 23rd of march then we um just kept a kept an eye on those um i to and fro quite a few of the the revisions between um the rwa and amanda and um and pete um at the national Science academy just to see what was feasible and and sort of do the risk assessment and see what we could actually achieve when it came down to training, again, we, we we worked remotely. So I brought back my center manager and chief instructor. Um, so effectively, we're operating as a three-man crew, um, and we um, we sort of discussed it remotely and fairly um, amongst ourselves, and and just number one to see what they are happy with, um, you know, and what they felt comfortable with, um, and it's almost like we all bought into what we were going to do. Um, you know, so there wasn't anything whereby it was it was sort of like, yep, this is how we're operating. But obviously, their own safety is paramount as well. So, you know, is it, it was kind of key that they bought into it, um, and and we all kind of agreed, you know, how we're going to operate. So, and you know, for the most part, it's it's it worked brilliantly, it worked really really well, and you know, thanks to those guys. Presumably. Um customers coming down to the center can also bring their own kit if they're at an appropriate level is that correct yeah i mean it, the reality is that there are some that have have brought their kit for the most part they're using ours um i'd say probably 90 percent are using our own equipment if they've bought their own kit then obviously we will help facilitate that if they're having some private tuition with us 
but in addition to that, we we will provide the the disinfectant at any time that they want to disinfect it at the end as well. So so that's there. We bought we bought copious amounts. <laughs> Great. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks. And really good to hear that there's been a bit of a boom um, in home waters as well, and people people getting out. Some of the sites around the coast and people windsurfing and and getting kayaking and kite surfing have, have just been phenomenal. So it's really good to hear that's that there's a positive side to this as well. Um, and that regime around disinfecting kit, I think, is, is going to be key for a lot of the clubs that have their own boats and want members to come down and, and utilise those. So some, some good advice there. Um, so in terms of the launch and recovery side of things, I know that you mentioned you may well help rig um, kit and then you leave it for your customers. You've got a reasonably wide slipway. How do you kind of maintain that social distancing um, if you've got perhaps a few people around at the same time looking to launch and recover? Um, we have, uh, just to give you a sort of paint the picture a little bit, we have a um, rigging area in front of the centre, so some, some black mats um, effectively reconstituted underlay for AstroTurf that we, we had. Um, and uh, what we've done is we've used some cones and then some chairs and then some tyres so that basically there's a very clear area where um, clients will can, can rest and, and, and be within earshot but actually sit there and relax whilst we rig the kit. Um, they then, once we retreat from the kit, they can come beyond the cones and pick up the kit and then and then launch straight onto, the, you know, again, we're very blessed with where we are, but the slipway's right there, so they go straight into the water. When they come back in, they come back in and they put it on the black mats again, and then they will retreat beyond the cones again and then they can stay there. So then we can approach the kit. And what we actually use is we have, um, uh, you know, a weed killer, so you kind of pressurize it with a handle um, and then uh, and then a sort of a spray gun effectively. So we've got the disinfectant in there and you can disinfect the kit, um, the boom, the, the, the foot straps, etc., and all the rest of it, and then leave the kit there for, for it to sort of wash, up, wash off. We've also got obviously a hose um, that's very accessible, very easy. So once we've disinfected it, we can, we can um, spray it down as well at the end of the day so um so yeah so that's how we kind of operate it's very strict or obvious area where it's kind of it, it's quite clear for people where they should be in and shouldn't be effectively fantastic thanks yeah i really like the idea of those strong visual cues to help people understand where they should and, and shouldn't be at different times i think that's a great idea um, and of course, the, the reason why everyone wants to come down to the centre is to get out on the water and actually um, go windsurfing, have some tuition, enjoy themselves. Um, and we know that safety afloat is a, is a critical part of that kind of experience. So um, it, it's on a lot of clubs' minds about maintaining social distancing while providing safety cover. What, what kind of considerations have, have you had there and what measures have you put in place? Uh, well, so first and foremost, we try our best. Um, not to have to use the rescue cover that that's the reality of it so um, we we obviously always provide it we've got a couple of very good ribs funnily enough that we bought from the RYA um, <laughs> that, um, that are very very well maintained and ultimately we we have that available to us if we need to um, but what we try and do is actually tailor the situation and the the um, the session so that we actually mitigate the use of rescue cover um, so again it it depends on the conditions on the day and the session that we're running um, but we have obviously right in front of the center sort of almost like a quadrant of um, flat water that's protected by the pontoons um, and uh, and and the um, breakwater around us um, so we we try and stay within there for example if if we're teaching beginners um, we have the sandbar so at different tide states the sandbar is exposed so again if there is a, an intermediate session again we we tailor the timing and the conditions we're going to use so that we can potentially do it on the sandbar so they don't need to go out of their depth so much and it, it's very easy to sort of self-rescue so um, it's down to the briefings that we do um, and particularly again when it comes down to the, the sessions that we're running tuition wise it's maximum of two to one um, so the the uh, instructor has runs a fairly close ship or a tight ship where they they can kind of keep keep a range of everyone. So um, as of yet, we've we've been operating for three weeks now. As of yet, we haven't had to rescue anybody, um, and that that's that's the reality of it. So um, it's always there, but um, if we if we you know the, the the normal procedure for rescuing a windsurfer approaching from the mast. Um, 
it means that you are instantly putting yourself sort of four meters away from the uh, the student anyway, which is great. Um, but like I said, we haven't had to operate in, in that manner yet. So. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks very much. It's interesting you sort of mentioned the decision to go afloat there and considering other factors like the weather, the kind of, you know, the, the tidal state and so on. Um, has that changed? Have those considerations changed at all, given the current situation, as opposed to perhaps where we have been in the past? Yeah, so um, yeah, definitely. With with regards to um, uh, sort of normally, normal windsurfing in the past before COVID-19, we we obviously limited the wind range that people went into, but it was fairly, fairly extreme. I mean, you know, where we are, it tends to sort of, the wind tends to accelerate between the mainland and Portland. So it accelerates over Chesil Bank. So we're exposed to some pretty strong winds. Um, and for the most part, wind surfers tend to kind of, you know, if they're that experience of going out in strong winds, they know their limits. Um, so we, we kind of, um, you know, again, fairly relaxed with regards to, you know that upper wind limit whereas with now with COVID-19 we're, we're much stricter so we've reduced the sailing areas that we're using um, um, it, it, you know again we're fairly blessed with where the center is so we can always say it's very simple we sort of say if you can't see the center we can't see you very simple stay within this area um, but we've actually reduced that quite a bit more so we know that quality of instruction is important to you um, at the OTC and in fairness all our way training centers so what I'm curious about is how you've managed to maintain your high quality of tuition when at the same time you've got social distancing requirements in, in place. Um, and what we do have, which we, we've been operating in the past, which is a great um, instructional um, tool, is um, BB Talking, so effectively the Bluetooth headset. So we've actually been using that even for beginners, for example, on occasions whereby you know they, they're wearing a helmet and it does look fairly funny wearing a helmet in sort of four or five knots but you know again it means that they can be a hundred meters away and you can still provide tuition very calmly in their ear so um so you know it's it's it is one of those things where um we've we've had to tailor the the sessions accordingly but by operating low numbers actually it's very achievable Great, thanks very much. Some really useful information in there and, and great to see some innovation as well, thinking um, you know, about how you can still provide that quality of tuition to your to your students whilst maintaining their safety. That's great. Um, and just in terms of rescue scenarios, I guess there might be a time where you'd perhaps have to consider getting someone out of the water where that social distancing wouldn't be possible. Um, have you thought about the provision of PPE or anything along those lines for your safety boat drivers, for your instructors? Um, so we have thought about it. We have considered it. Um, I'd say, you know, again, with the gloves to gloves, for example, it's, um, it's a vague one. Um, you know, again, we haven't really gone down that route. We, we, we're not using gloves again. It, it means that they get infected and then you, you have the same situation anyway. We do have, um, so there's a local sail uh, repairer that we use called Moat Sales, and they've been making some shields, so face, face shields. Um, and we we have them, um, we haven't had to use them, um, but we, we do have them. The reality is they, they've boot, like sort of um, uh, made them more durable for us, so they're using a thicker plastic, um, so that if you are going on a rib, for example, and the wind's blowing, you know, it won't sort of impact your face. <laughs> But like I said, um, touch wood, we haven't had to use them yet. Um, uh, and uh, the guys have them on sort of effectively holsters so that they are available to them at all times. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't had to use them. Tris, what, what's, what's been the biggest challenge you've faced so far with opening your, your, your centre down there in Weymouth? Um, like I said, I think the, the general response by the clientele has been fantastic. They've been um, super patient, really respectful of the social distancing. Um, very, um, you know, there's there's not been a single voice uttered in in negativity with regards to um, you know our operating procedures. They all adhere to it. I said the 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 biggest issue, really, I suppose, is is people relaxing a little bit. You know, it's very easy. Once you've come off the water, to go ah, 
you know, I'm refreshed. I've had a, had a great session and the, the mindset is, you know, everything's back to normal a little bit. So then, you know, people relax a little bit. And I suppose that that's kind of the, the biggest threat is that, you know, again, re-engaging once you're back on land, that um, the session, the, 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 the situation is still very much apparent. Brilliant. Fantastic. It's been um, really useful to hear about all the kind of um, processes that you've been through, the amount of hard work that you've put into getting the centre up and running and, and kind of maintaining a really good level of service for your customers. So that's great to and ultimately getting people on the water. Um, we've got clubs that are looking to restart training over the coming weeks. And it would just be really useful to hear what your thoughts are, what your advice would be to those clubs thinking about restarting training. Um, I don't know whether you can summarise a key, a few key thoughts for them. Yeah, I suppose, suppose the, the most important thing is communication, you know, so communicating how you're going to operate, um, you know, so we we put it out on our, our blog straight away and, and trying to ask people to adhere to that and look at that. So we put it, on, you know, all the links on social media. Um, so we communicated it in that way. Um, we communicate um, regularly amongst the team. So any um, reservations, any issues that the guys have, you know, that they can keep coming back to me and we can revise things. Um, communication with Portland Harbour authorities and the National Sailing Academy, you know, obviously our, our, the, the guys that we operate with um, and in partnership with in the locality. Um, and then just keeping abreast with, um, you know, government guidance um, and how that's changing all the time. Um, it is a constantly evolving picture, and I suppose that's that's kind of the the thing for us is making sure that we are still adhering to what the guidance is. Um, but um, but again, just um, you know, like with regards to the local um, situation, just making sure that the the guys are happy and comfortable. You know, so um, we always have a quite an open um, uh, relationship with the guys and making sure that they can always come to me if they have any reservations and you know just maintaining that um that that level of you know two-way street sort of thing great so it sounds like communication is coming through as a really strong thread there across a number of different people that are involved from the instructors to the customers to your other stakeholders so yeah great great advice there i think and then just that that ongoing kind of re reviewing of the situation with your instructors with the procedures with the, the kind of guidance and so on so yeah really good thanks very much indeed great um thanks craig and tris really useful to get your in input on this important topic and for helping to explain the restarting training center guidance notes and actually describing how they can be applied at a at a club or at a center so good session really useful thanks everybody if you're out there and you're looking to restart some training activity at your club, we are running club development forums on this topic uh, next week. That's week commencing the 8th of June. There's going to be at least two forums per region. They're a great chance to talk to other clubs, to share ideas and to hear some of the latest guidance. So, um, so check those out. That's it for this week. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks to Craig. Thanks to Tris. And uh, please stay safe.